Welcome back to the Black Corner. I'm Lesokha van Niekerk and I'm here with my co-host, Sibusi Somkosana. Sani Bonani, we are so excited to get back into it. And today we are discussing a subject that is very personal to both of us and it's representation. Welcome back to the Black Corner. I'm Lesokha van Niekerk and I'm here with my co-host, Sibusi Somkosana. Sani Bonani, we are so excited to get back into it. And today we are discussing a subject that is very personal to both of us and it's representation. Absolutely. Um, and as you know from our previous episode, we asked you to engage with us on our social media platforms using our hashtag BeBlackCorner. And this week we ask you the question, when have you experienced positive representation and when have you experienced negative representation as a person of color in musical theater and entertainment? And Dudley, I'm going to start with you. Uh, my experience of positive representation dates back to when I was 10. And I remember there was a, a documentary on the TV about the making of The Lion King in South Africa. And I remember watching that and seeing little boys that were my age doing something that I hadn't dreamt before. Like, I, at that time, I probably wanted to be a doctor. And I remember seeing this documentary and it literally changed my life because suddenly, here were these little boys from townships. And I was watching them go through the entire process of the making of The Lion King. And I can be honest and say, that is where my dream of performing started. And it's quite a weird thing because I ended up working with a few people who I watched as a young 10-year-old on that documentary. And namely, Ndambora Patla, who's one of my closest friends, and the dear Andile Kumbi, may his soul rest in peace. It was a, a really beautiful memory for me. Mm. Yeah, I mean, mine is similar. I think I was about 13 years old when mm. I bumped into a... Um, a viewing, a show of African Footprint on television. And, you know, I just, as I switched the television on, I saw these two black bodies on stage, a man and a woman, and they were dancing a pas de deux duet. Mm. And absolutely trained, chiseled bodies, you know, technique like you can't believe. And mm. I don't think I'd ever seen anything like that, um, besides maybe Alvin Ailey. Yeah. And even when Alvin Ailey, they so far away for me, it felt like it was unattainable. And I saw these two people and I could tell one was colored and one was black. Wow. And I thought, oh my God, I can't believe what I'm watching. Fast forward to when I'm 18 years old, I auditioned for African Footprint and I get the part. What, what got me the most is that I got to perform the same dance that I watched when I was 13 years old. That's amazing. And I think when I think about that, it, it basically shows me that whatever we imprint in our subconscious, we almost get to play out in our mm -hmm. lives. Very true. And I mean, that's just testament to the power of um, representation because you ended up doing that show and Lion King has been such a, 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 a dream for me. It's been something that's made me work very hard because I would one day like to realize that dream. So it has been a pushing factor in my life as well. Definitely. And I think any time that I find myself in the room as the only person of color, that is when I feel negative representation and it becomes a difficult thing for me and the maths never adds up for me because I live in a country where it's 82% black people. So when I walk into a room and I only see myself, I, I don't get that and I, that's a very negative feeling for me. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I suppose it also speaks to something that's deeper, which is tokenism. And tokenism takes it a step further. It turns people of color against each other. Yes, because... You, there's no, there's not enough space for both of no. us, and you have to be, you know, one of three things. Yeah. The only black, the best black, or the the first black. You know. Yeah. And if you're not, if you're not one of those three things, it becomes hard for you to navigate your space. Yeah. 
very deep. It's deep. So we want to continue the conversation with you on our social media platforms using our hashtag, The Black Corner. We ask you the question, what is your experience of positive representation and negative representation as a person of color in musical theater and entertainment? We have an artistic friend of ours who's going to share their experiences with you. Hello, my name is Clint Lesh and I'm a theater practitioner. I'm going to share a couple of experiences with you specifically within the musical theater industry. Let me start with a positive. Every single time I have been included in a musical, whether it's in the capacity of the creative team or fulfilling a role, every single time that I felt a sense of fair inclusion um, based on merit. And when I say merit, I mean my skills, my talent, my experience then I really, really felt that I was fairly, accurately and respectfully represented in a process or in a project. On the other hand, every single time I was excluded for reasons none other than the colour of my skin really, um, or when I was included in a project or cast in a role, as, as a form of tokenism, being the token person of colour um, for the producer or the director or whoever to just merely tick a box and say, oh look, we've cast a person of colour. I think in South Africa we have such a long way to go. Globally we have such a long way to go. And it is all of our responsibility, globally and collectively to do the work towards progression and diversity and inclusion. So today on The Black Corner, we are sitting down with director and producer Clive Matibe, as well as performer and director Lebo Toko. Guys, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Hi, guys. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. <laughs> and congratulations on The Black Corner. Thank you so thank much. You. I thank mean, you. We thought it was very important to have these conversations and you guys were really at the top of the list because, you know, you, you kind of know both sides. You know the sides of being a performer. You also know the side of being behind the scenes and actually creating the stuff. So we thought you might have something really interesting to say. So I'm going to yeah. jump right into it. Yeah, let's do it. Let's go. I'm going to jump right into <laughs> it. So I think we've been talking with Sibu about our positive and negative representations that we saw as, as people coming up, you know, young performers. And we shared a story each that we realized imprinted something in our subconscious as young people, and we ended up actually playing it out in our lives. So how important do you think it is for people of color to see themselves in a good light um, from an early age? And what do you think the outcome is of either seeing yourself positively or negatively represented on stages and television and entertainment, really? Well, I think representation is everything. Um, and we've seen the importance of representation and, and the power of representation and how it translates into, into how children see themselves and the possibilities that they see for their lives, the dreams that they can dream, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, if a child grows up not seeing anybody in Equestrate Sabona as a, uh, a doctor or a pilot, or, or those careers that are so far from us, so then yeah. you've got no reference, right? Uh, it's not around you, so yeah. you can't, and it's not even represented in the media, you know? Uh, so, so you've got no access to those kind of dreams, you know? Mm -hmm. So representation is important because sometimes it either limits or opens up a world of possibilities yeah. for, for any child black, white, uh, purple, pink, or whatever, you know? Uh, and I think in terms of our industry, I know for myself, when I was growing up, I went to an art school, went to Pro Arte, I studied drama there, and then I continued to go and study drama at uh, Tony University of Technology, when mm. it was still Pretoria Technicon. Oh my, oh my. <laughs> don't give away your age, darling. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, when you get to those places, when it's time to choose pieces uh, for, for monologue exams, when it's time for the school productions to happen, there are no pieces that kind of 
represent black people. You know, the big roles are, are for, don't exist. they don't exist, yeah. you know, yeah. and it started from there already, yeah. you know, when one realized that in this career that you've chosen, uh, because then things like producing and directing were far from us. So we mm. knew that we, we were, went to study drama because we wanted to become performers, yeah. but we were limited even in the kind of roles that we had from even studying yeah. already, yeah. you know, yeah. so, yeah. so representation in, in the media, yeah, even in our education systems, it's, it's mm. something that we still need to work on. So, touching on that, Clive, how does that affect your confidence as a as a student? Because now here you are sitting in a in a space, and you you barely see yourself. Doesn't that already kind of set you at a lower starting point than your white counterparts? Does that affect your your, your confidence? Yeah. Yeah, it absolutely does. But I think I was fortunate enough to be, uh, you know, from high school, I got the opportunity to play even the white roles, you know. Mm. Uh, so but it's not all schools that, that were that flexible and that were that open, you know. Yeah. But it certainly did affect my confidence and more than my confidence, it affected how uh, it, it made me start asking myself questions about if... I am actually going to succeed in this career, you know, if from already from uh, varsity, uh, the big dramas, the musicals, the operas Mm. are mainly for people that don't look like me, then where am I going to work? And I think that's what propelled me to to start looking outside of performance and say, maybe I should should produce, maybe I should direct uh, because maybe right now uh there isn't anything that represents me so so it did certainly like more than my confidence it made me think twice about going into this career Mm -hmm. you know with uh, just to um touch on to what clive is also saying or add on for me at varsity the one time or the one moment i looked forward to was going out to seeing the shows right and hearing that my seniors, some of my seniors that are black are in these shows mm. and that gave me confidence and hope and understanding that I too have a career in this because mm. at, at varsity, I didn't see it. I yeah. didn't have it. So it would take going to see the shows and, and going backstage and waiting for the black artists mm-hmm. to speak to them and say, how do you feel? How do I get here? And for them to almost take on the role of being like a mentor because we yeah. don't have yeah. You know, a, a mentor of our color within the industry itself, because you always spoken. I don't know if it was um, this thing of um, helping you have a thick skin. And if it was, it was done very much in the wrong way, because that's not the thick skin one wanted or needed. The thick skin we wanted to face this industry and the career with everything that they have, but also knowing that we're all equal and we also belong and we also have roles which mm-hmm. we were told we don't. And you will always forever be the black token. So you were almost made to feel like you were lucky um, to be where you are or yeah. to be in a production or to yeah. even yeah. succeed. Yes. And I mean, Lebo, speaking of the token, um, let's just get into it. What are the true dangers of tokenism on, on that one black, that's the token? It's the, I find that it's, Accepting it without knowing that you're accepting it and forever being the stereotype of the black token. And what I mean by that is every single show that you go and audition for, Mm -hmm. you already become typecast and you're already thankful. Mm -hmm. But now the dangers of that as well is our reality, right? I need to put food on my table. Mm -hmm. And um, it takes a long minute or some time for me to even understand my worth and value to say no to that as much as I want to belong to that musical or show or whatever it is, but I need to be seen for my worth and need to be respected for what I bring to the table. And I can no longer participate in just saying thank you for the job because ultimately it boils down to you saying thank you for the job. And it it, it cows away at your soul, at your spirit, because you will forever be the black token. Anybody that doesn't understand the black token, it's that one black person and the entire show and you are forever either at the back or you're told for some funny reason you've got the X factor, which I don't understand mm. when it comes to an entire car full of white people and you're the only person who has you've got the X factor. <laughs> what? Skin is the X factor? Oh. What's the X factor? Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think also the dangers of tokenism in a broader sense is that it limits us as black people, right? Mm. As a people generally. 
Uh, and tokenism extends beyond our, our industry. You know, we often have this whole, the first black Miss Universe. Oh, my God. The oh first, my God. The first black female pilot. Yeah. The first black whatever. Yeah. When are we going to stop those things? Yeah. When are those things going to end? Because what it does is that it, 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 it says that there's only a small number of you who can be allowed to succeed and to be great at a time. Yeah. The rest of you must wait, wait backstage, you know, that the world doesn't have enough space for more than three, four, five of you. So mm. that's why it will forever be the first black female, what, 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 the Absolutely. first black, whatever. And, and there's no, the first white, whatever. Never. Is the none of them. They can just live their lives. I Nobody's mean, putting labels on them. They can just go about their lives, yeah. you know. And say with what you're saying, I mean, the first black, Sibu and I broke it down a little bit earlier that to be great as a black person, you kind of almost have to fit into one of the three categories of being the best black, the only black, or the first black. Yeah. You see, so yeah. now if you don't fit in <laughs> if you, <laughs> So if you don't fit into any one of those now, how do you become one of those? You then have to boot the other one out, right? Because now there's not yeah. enough space for Siwa and I to be the best black. So now I have to boot yeah. him out and now it creates hatred between the two of us. So not only, not only is tokenism dangerous in that sense, then it pins us against each other. Because now I, yeah. I don't want to share a room with you because you're going to take my best position. Yes, I don't think I don't have spoken that there isn't enough space for all of us to share. Yeah. And it becomes so hard to be that only black because you have to be the most skilled of all just to get your foot in the door. Yes. So if you look around yes. you, you have to basically be the best one just to be in the ensemble at the back in row number <laughs> E. <laughs> but you have to be yeah. the most talented, which is ridiculous. Mm. It's, it's ridiculous. ridiculous. And, and you don't, don't even get, get the best, best role even after being the best black. black. Never. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I actually wanted to ask you guys now, have you ever been asked to perpetuate a stereotype or being asked to be more black? Because now obviously as a token, you know, you you, know, you, you level you know <laughs> levels that can I just say if levels if levels camera had feelings, it would be feeling very insulted right now. Because you keep going into your camera. I mean you feel strongly about this. Talk about it, be more black. This is I really do. Like on more than one account, I've been asked to be more black and reminded that I am black and I'm South African. Mm -hmm. You know, um, whether it be uh, television, whether it be musical theatre, whether it be street theatre, any form of entertainment, I remember a very prominent um, in front of a white panel, right? The one uh, producer was black, and I was auditioning for this musical. And there's just two things. Firstly, what is a South African accent? They ask me, please have a South African accent. I don't know if I don't know if I don't know. I don't know what qualifies you to have a South African accent. Let's leave it there. Second of all, then produce the still remind me in front of this panel that I need to find more blackness in me and I am identify with the blackness within me. And I stood there very perplexed and confused as to wow. What do you mean? Mm. I need to identify. I'm, I'm black. Already, I'm surely. <laughs> yeah, my blackness is in question. Surely, you know exactly, and not just not just that. Many a times, on many occasions, even in in the show itself, the director will direct me, and uh, whether I've got a cameo role or whatever, not I'll still be. I'll actually be directed upon my blackness on how to be on black. How to be black. Whether I'm too loud, whether I'm too uh, uh, um, or too curvaceous, curvaceous be told that I, black people don't walk that way. Be told that <laughs> more black, you know, um, what's more black? Be loud, don't be loud, and therefore even limit my um, way of developing a character for myself, a black character. I mean, they don't come that often, yeah. and when you get yeah. it, you just like, oh, thank Allow the me Lord. Now. This character, let me, you know, develop it and bring myself into this character. That opportunity gets even it, it gets taken away from me because the director, white director, will still feel the need to, to tell, question your blackness. To question your blackness and tell you how to be black. And it still goes on to date 2020. Wow. You know, just I think just two years ago, maybe, I found myself in a very confused situation where um our individual characters given to us 
were supposed to be designed around your personality, who you are. So we don't want to deviate too much from who Lesejo is. But I found my director saying to me, you're too elegant. And I thought, now what does that mean? <laughs> and oh, 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 wait for it. I was then directed to go with the truck driver feel. Yeah. And I actually just remembered that because I, I, I thought, so what does I that mean? Does that, that. Yeah. yeah. Does that mean that um, a black woman cannot be elegant? And I, and I was the to and I was a token. I was a token once again, you know. But you were you were telling me something about a friend of yours who actually left musical theatre because she was tired of the typecast. Yeah, my I have a friend who is a stunning, stunning performer, and she she's she's decided not to do musical theatre shows anymore because she's tired of playing the maid. She's tired of playing the maid. I mean, and by the maid, I mean the maid. I'm not talking about you know those kind of characters. I'm, I'm referring. Yeah specifically to the maid and i think it's so soul crushing to watch such a brilliant talent decide not to do this anymore because i think you and i have both gotten to places where we've questioned whether to go on anymore because it becomes so soul crushing that you just look at it and you feel so small compared to how big yeah. this issue seems because this has affected people before us and it still continues to affect me and you in 2020. Yeah. It's not like these conversations yeah. have never been had, but they were being had behind closed doors, in hotel rooms, in the bus, after the show, in the lift. You know how it goes. We were being polite about having the conversations, you know, mm. um, because we're still trying to protect work. We're still trying to, pro we're still trying to be hired. Um, so it was hard for us to have these conversations. We, we are, black people are very polite about what they want, yeah. you know, uh, mm. and all the things that and and just going back to your question earlier about perpetuating and being asked to perpetuate this from a producing point of view, sometimes when you're working with corporate clients um, that that sell products for for black people, but it's these white um, big corporate giants uh, that would ask for you to create corporate theater for them or whatever. Um, there was one that we worked with late last year and, and after presenting the script, we were told that this script, you know, this brand, our brand is for black people, but it's not for black people who speak like that, you know? It's for upper black people, you know? It's for affluent black people. Uh, and, and, you're, and the thing about it is you're told this by also black marketing directors as well, you know? Uh, so it, it comes both ways, black marketing directors and white marketing directors who are at the uh, position to really uh, structure how messaging around identity and representation comes across out there in the public are the ones that are, are manipulating these messaging and are the ones that are either dumbing down our blackness or being apologetic for our blackness because of uh, trying to sell certain products. So yes, you, we are often asked as producers to, to perpetuate it and you can fight for it. And I remember one of the actresses that was in it, uh, I, I know I can mention her name, this is really hard she said, uh, like face to face with the client and she was like, but, but what do you mean? This is who I am as a black person. A black person in Soweto is affluent. Have you been to Soweto? Have you seen how affluent black people are in Soweto or in Mabupani or in, you know, mm. it doesn't mean that just because I live in a township, I'm not affluent, yeah, you know? Awesome. Uh, um, so, so it comes to that as well, you know, and, and it, it really crushes actors, like you were saying, uh, and it, it, it really disheartens producers as well. And then we're faced with, do you want to make the coin or not, you know, do you want to uh, uh, continue or not? And in some cases, you have to just be adamant and say, okay, guys, as actors, we'll say yes to her, but when we get out there, the people we're performing to, we know who they are and we know what they respond to. And we often just switch it and do it the way that we want to do it. And most of the time it works because we know who we're speaking to and how they need to be spoken to. How they need to receive yeah. the message, exactly. On the show today, we have international producer and a dear friend of mine. We have David Bloch joining us for a conversation. Hello, Mr. Bloch. 
<laughs> hello, everybody. How's it, guys? Thanks so much for having me today. Hello, hello. hello. Wonderful to see you. Look at that black corner logo, and you are so you are too marvelous. I love it. Too marvelous. Ten points. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, because of how we're having to reinvent ourselves, um, and because everyone is 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 attempting to do online streaming um, and creating content. Um, from home, I had this TV here. So every time, you know, I either uh, give a client presentation or I'm talking to some member of my family, I always feel like I, I now have to have something on <gasps> this screen. And I was like, well, I don't want to put my own logo on it. So I just, I just thought, well, I'd put, you know, the black corner. And I thought it would look quite posh. Oh, thank you, David. And welcome to the black corner. Welcome, welcome to the black corner. Welcome. Thank you. You know, uh, the black thank corner so is, it's the natural gathering of black people in the place of work. So for myself and Cebu, we're taking this, what, what, what is a bit of a negative connotation. We're taking it, we're owning it. And we're also inviting you into the black corner. Because I think the issue is that we've been having conversations within the black corner and we haven't been extending those conversations, but expecting to be understood and it doesn't work like that. So we have to open our black corner and we have to allow people in if we want them to, to, to hear what, what we have to say. And I think the first thing that well, we can... It was interesting, the two of us, I think we spoke, I would actually never heard of the term black corner. Yeah. Uh, I didn't even know that it was such a thing. So... so I, I was quite amazed when we had a discussion offline prior to today's interview yeah. that yeah. there was even such a thing, certainly within musical theatre, within corporate, which I was blissfully unaware of possibly, that there was even such a thing as the black corner. Yeah. So I think to to spin it in a more positive mindset, I think, is, is vitally important, certainly for somebody like me who was completely unaware of it to begin with. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's why it's important then to have these conversations across the board, because now... I, yeah. I wouldn't have known that you didn't know that if you didn't tell me. And yeah. there are so many things about my lived experience that I can tell you yeah. that will leave your jaw on the floor because you just I'm don't sure. have a way of knowing. Because you just don't know. Yeah. 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 You just don't know. Yeah. yeah. But I think, David, from us, you know, we invited you on a, you know, you, you're a creator, you're a producer, you, you, you stand behind the scene. You've, you've been a performer, of course. Your, your background is in musical theatre, so you understand what it's like to be in front of the camera, but you also understand what it's like to be behind and actually creating what we're going to be seeing. So I think we wanted to, first of all, know, did you have any idea that black people kind of always find themselves typecasted, um, asked to perpetuate the stereotype, asked to, you know, be more black? Do you, is that a thing that you know of? You know, it's interesting because I was listening to Lebo and to Clive. And I mean, Clive and I studied at the same institution also back when it was, before it was TUT and it was the um, Technicon Pretoria. I left Cape Town uh, to study in Pretoria. Um, and then after, after graduating, uh, it, had, it was pretty much just after Nelson Mandela was elected our first state president. And suddenly a lot of the type of shows that I had trained for, the musical theater, the proverbial Broadway West End show, mm. suddenly was no longer available because the arts councils had, had collapsed. There wasn't really that much funding for these big scale musicals. And it was interesting hearing what Clive and Lebo were speaking about. You know, they were talking or questioning their role in whether there was even a future in theater for them because of the lack of roles. Yeah. And strangely enough, at a time when I was just starting my career, because there was no musical theater suddenly in South Africa, I was questioning my role within musical theater and the type of things I had trained for, which was now no longer in South Africa, because I think as a country, South Africa was trying to find its own voice. It was trying to, to try, it was trying to um, discover its own stories, mm. uh, as opposed to something that was just being imported constantly all the time. And it was because of that lack of work on so many levels that I deviated into producing and directing. It was never my, what I thought was my trajectory. Um, it was something that happened purely, I think, out of, out of circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I've always been aware of ensuring that whatever we do and however we cast the shows, I guess, that it is representative in, in as many ways as possible. But certainly the idea of, uh, representation to the point where you need, you know, you're not black enough, and you and you potentially being cast because you are a person of color. And hearing those stories that even a person of color is telling somebody else that's a person of color that they're not black enough, I've I've never heard of before. Like that was a big surprise to me in the earlier part of your interview, guys. Like I'd never heard that, because even something like um, the comment about being the first black, for me as a white person. I feel it's so important that we are made aware of that because for me as a white person, how it resonates with me is the fact that 
whilst it shouldn't be a big issue, um, the fact that a person, even in 2020, or certainly in the last few years, can still stand up and say, I am the first black, et cetera, et cetera. It, it shouldn't be like that, but it yeah. drives home how much change we still need to make. Yeah. yeah. How much more? I mean, when Beyonce stood up and said that she's proud to be the first African-American woman to perform at Coachella, I was like, wow, is she? You know, you almost <laughs> question, crazy. like, yeah. in this yeah. time of our lives, is that even possible? That, yeah. that she was the first African-American to, to headline Coachella. So it makes me realize as a white person that that shouldn't be happening. Yeah, like, and this is even, it's even happening to a Beyonce. So can you imagine what's happening yeah. to, you know, on the, on the ground level, what's actually going on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, quite, it's quite hectic. And I mean, as a, as a producer director, you, are, you must be in the room for conversations based on casting. And my question is that in casting, is it ever discussed um, to, inter to, to make a role that was previously seen white, for example, to make it black if the script doesn't necessarily say. And I look at characters that, like there's so many characters that were obviously originated by white people because at the time when these shows were written, black people were not allowed to go on those stages. But now yeah. you look at the, a lot of scripts and you go, but this could be anyone. And you look at those shows yeah. and you're like, but they're still getting cast in the same way they were cast in 1920. And it's yeah. just, yeah, so like, do these conversations happen? The funny thing is, Cebu, like for me, I think because I focus primarily now more on corporate, I don't think I'm as privy to those kind of conversations within the musical theater or theater realm. Mm -hmm. But what I, what I remembered this morning, and, I, and I, I don't know why it didn't come up before, is funnily enough, the last time I saw Chicago, the musical overseas, and I don't know if myself or Debbie ever mentioned Lesejo to you when we had seen it, but the role of Roxy, was played by Brandy. Yes, Love Debbie, Debbie told me yeah. that when she came back, yeah. yeah. And what was so incredible was at the time, I wasn't even aware that, that Brandy was portraying Roxy. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about it was it was so different. Her, her delivery was different. Um, the, the way she portrayed the character, I mean, I've always known Roxy to be this kind of very quirky, yeah. kooky kind of white 1920s flapper with the, you know, the white hair, Caucasian white girl. And, to suddenly see Brandy in the role, first of all, was a revelation because she brought a, a fresh approach to it. Yeah. It didn't feel forced as well because nothing says that anyone in Chicago can't be African-American, neither the title roles of Velma nor the title role of Roxy. It's not to say that Mama Morton is the only person yeah. that can be of color. But the funny thing is, is there was a whole different audience suddenly in the theater as well. And I mean, you find that people, and I mean, and, and, and I say this with respect, and I hope it doesn't come across in a bad way, but what I love about certainly African-American um, people is they are so vocal. So suddenly when Roxy would make a comment that in, in a more traditional, maybe white environment or a white audience, everyone would just watch and whatever, you know, you had audience going, yes, girl, you know, and they were talking back to her, not that Roxy as a performer, as a character was ever kind of acknowledging the audience yeah. but I remember sitting back and you kind of get wrapped up in it and what I loved is that it brought a whole different dynamic to the show and you know you mentioned something very interesting with Brandy which with what you're saying making mm -hmm. it a natural thing I found my favorite yeah. thing of watching her on the show was how she delivered her songs um songs that uh previ that previously sound very Caucasian and she just yeah. came with the soulful thing. It was the same song, but for me, yeah. the song yeah. then read differently and I felt differently about the song and I actually found myself in the song because I, I, I could just yeah. hear this woman that she sounded like me. And it, it also, like you're saying, it makes it a bit more natural. It's not, you know, you're not trying to force things on people. And also the audience, it opens the audience up to respond. I mean, I think the African-Americans in the audience were responding because that sounded natural to them. Yeah. Whereas Absolutely. chances are they, they, they're not used to responding to a Caucasian woman hanging off a ladder. That's not, yeah. that's not, that's not part of their gig, you know what I mean? And yeah. I think you also mentioned Absolutely. something quite important, David, when you said that you were sitting in the audience and you were feeling the energy from people that usually wouldn't be at the theater. And I experienced that yeah. when I recently did um, an all black show and suddenly I stepped out in, onto that stage and I saw a sea of my own people and performing yeah. every night just became so much more special because mm -hmm. suddenly yeah. there was a lady there that looked like my mom and there would be a man there that reminded me of my dad. Mm -hmm. And it's such a beautiful yeah. thing to, to go because it makes you go to the theater as well when you see a show yeah. 
that is depicting your experiences. And I think we don't see our people in the theatres because they don't feel that it's their thing. And uh, I, think, so. mm. I, think, I think the problem, maybe, maybe problem is the wrong word to use, but I, I'm not sure if you saw Hazel Feldman's production of um, Dream Girls when it was at the Teatro at Monte yeah. Cassino. Beautiful production. I, I personally thought it was one of the best productions I'd ever seen. And I've always loved the music ever since I was a kid before even realizing that, and I'm telling you as a song mm. was from mm. musical. I remember Jennifer Holiday as a young kid. I remember who Jennifer Holiday was. And I don't know if in South Africa, the story maybe, because the show itself didn't do well at all. It actually bombed. Um, and I don't know if it's because a, the assumption was that it's an African-American musical. So maybe that's where the first mistake was, I don't know. And therefore, anyone of color will flock to the theater to see it. Is it a story that resonates with people just because it's, it's a black cast? Mm. Will it resonate with the South African audience? Um, is it a story that people in, in South Africa can relate to? Are the ticket prices, um, are, are they the kind of prices that people can afford to even pay? Mm if you are a person of color. Um, so even though for me, this was the most incredible musical and hopefully it was a celebration of also people of color, maybe in a different context in America, it was seen differently to how it was seen here. Because I think a lot of people didn't come and whether it's because the story just didn't relate, you know, Motown yeah. actually, just, didn't, David, just didn't connect. I think actually we do connect with Motown. I grew up listening to the Temptations and, and Motown and all of these people. And people do relate to the story of the Dream Girls. The issue is that I think when, when people who are creating these shows, they actually have to go out of their way to get to the audience. You, you have to market it to the people the way they need to hear it. You have to go out of your way, you know. The people, the majority of the people also that you want to come out to the theaters, they're not sitting in Santon. So now if you're, no. putting, if you're putting those posters up in Santon, you're not getting to them. Yeah. Um, there's a whole, yeah. there's, there's a theater in Soweto. Why are we not taking it yeah, there? Yeah. If you want them to come and watch and, and the people that are on stage look like them, you almost have to go out yeah. of your way. So perhaps with shows like that, the, is the issue that we didn't go out of our way to market it the way we needed to market it for the people that we market for? Because when you're marketing any other, what, what white musical? Singing in the Rain, yeah. you know? If you take it to Santon, fabulous, yeah. fabulous, yes. you know? But, you know, if you want to get to the people, you, you have to get out of your way. And I think that's another thing that we, we need to realize is that it's not good Absolutely. enough anymore to just say, oh, yeah, no, I'm aware. I'm aware of it. I'm aware that. Yeah. But now once you're aware, I need you to now take a step further and then show me how you're going to, how you're going to include me. And I think this brings me to my third question that I want to rope um, Clive and Lebo back in. How, you know, as producers and directors, people who are, out there doing it um, in, in whichever capacity, whether you're in corporate, whether you're in the theater, um, how do you think moving forward, how are we going to actively start creating stuff to, to put, to represent black people in a positive light, not just black people, people of color, you know, what are, what are the small little actions that we can take to make sure we take those steps as producers and directors? Uh, I think one downfall we have as a people is that we, we know how to complain a lot about not being given the platform to do these things, right? Uh, and what the, the coronavirus has done is it has opened our eyes to many ways of, of representing ourselves. It has given us so many platforms, like such a platform, you know? Uh, I don't know if the coronavirus was here, was here, wasn't here, <laughs> if this such things could have been exactly. happening, you know? So I think now we must use the, the platforms that we have, uh, whether digitally, whether it, it's the platforms that we have with, with connects and contacts that we have, with theatres that we've worked at, to aggressively and purposefully tell our stories. Mm, yes, uh, yes. And I I think there's also a big divide between musical theatre, uh, black people and straight theatre people, you know, uh, black people. We don't speak to each other and there's a big opportunity for us to kind of um, create work that represents us in a way that we want to create that work if we could just collaborate a little bit more, you know? So we have to be intentional about collaborating, mm. you know? Uh, because there are so many resources that we have yeah. as black creators yeah. individually that we are not tapping into. 
together, yeah. you know, because we're all doing so many different things at the same time, mm. you know, and there's no impact because we're not intentional enough. Yeah. So I think for me, um, I, I, I always try to be as intentional as, as, as I possibly can to, to collaborate with other black creatives, uh, whether it be on television, the TV shows that I produce, whether it be, you know, I'm doing a lot of things digitally now uh, because of COVID-19. <laughs> uh, 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 with it also with the theatres that I that I work with and holding those theatres accountable. I have a great relationship with the Market Theatre and they've, they've luckily been a home for me and helped me to kind of use them as a platform to create these things. So mm -hmm. because these platforms are also there, our theatres, these are public spaces. The Joburg Theatre is a public, publicly funded space. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the theatre is publicly funded. The Market Theatre is publicly flat funded. Why, why are we not using those spaces? Those are our yeah. spaces. Yeah. We, we yeah. shouldn't have to wait to be commissioned or to be called or whatever. We need to go out there and hold these people accountable that are in charge of the spaces and say, we want to use these spaces to tell our stories the way we want to because these spaces are ours. So what I hear I you, what I hear you saying is we're actually in a way holding ourselves back. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We, Absolutely. You know, and you know, know, even in, in the most thing as a conversation in our spaces at these theaters, because these conversations we must actually destroy this thing called the black corner and keeping it there. We must start voicing them and speaking out loud. Absolutely. If something goes wrong, you need to voice it there, right there and there, and not keep it for a lunchtime to sit at that area where everybody looks at and says, There's the, there goes the black people. Mm -hmm. We need to destroy that and start voicing Absolutely. it now. And in the meantime, you're building resentment. I think also, um, it, it's in the way that it's discussed. I think we're so petrified of offending somebody. Yeah. As, as white people, we automatically become defensive because we think you're criticizing us. Have I said something wrong? What have I done? Yeah. Automatically, yeah. you're becoming aggressive because now you're not getting your point across or maybe it's not being said properly. I think if we all just take a back seat and we can have open and honest discussions like this, mm. for me, I would far rather than somebody going to the proverbial black corner is to come to me and say, David, can I speak to you for a moment? Yeah. I, I'd, I don't know if you realize what you just said or what you just did or the side eye or whatever, which I might have been completely unaware of, or I may have said something in a, in a way that I didn't feel was maybe um, hurtful. But if somebody mentioned it to me, I would want someone to mention it to me so that I don't do it again. Yeah. But I would, I would, out of respect to the performers that I work with and hopefully with the respect that they have for me as a producer, as a director, I would want to have that. I don't see it as criticism. I wouldn't see it as somebody being negative uh, or, or and I would I wouldn't want to be defensive about it I would want my eyes to be more open so that I'm more aware of it so that comments that we think are frivolous mm -hmm. and we just put out there without realizing it we don't do anymore yeah. you know yeah. but on a personal level I would far rather I mean when when I saw Lesejo put out that uh, message I think it was a forward from a mutual friend of ours oh, Gregory yes. Butler in yes. the US um it made me realize, and I, I didn't automatically think that maybe Lisejo was kind of directing her comments to me, but it made me realize and question, have I ever said something like that? Did I ever allude to something like that? Did I, ever, did I even pass a comment just without even realizing that for somebody else it had an impact? Um, but I have enough respect for Lisejo as a friend, and I knew that she had enough respect for me as a friend, first and foremost, aside from our working relationships that it could be something that we could talk about. I didn't want to feel afraid to put it out there. I didn't want to, I, I, I did think about, oh, should I say something? Should I not say something? But I felt like she's my friend and I wanted to say something. Absolutely, David. And this is, that's the reason why we're doing this. It's the power of the conversation. I just want to thank you guys just for taking time out of your day and sitting down here to have a little kiki with us. It's been educative and thank you so much. <laughs> Um, we're going to go on now and... Applause, applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> we're going to go on now and hear from more of our contributors on the topic that we've been discussing today. Wow, what a great question. But yet it's so layered. Just my experience in trying to assert myself as a choreographer and director in this industry. I remember walking into um, 
a studio where I was asked to come and be a casting choreographer. And when I walked in, the entire production team was sitting on the couch and all of them were white. And I remember walking up to the studio, I remember feeling so thankful and so confident and so excited about this new chapter. Yet when I walked in there, I looked at everybody, greeted them, was polite, excited, and I didn't really get acknowledgement. Um, at one point, the producer came over and wanted to know who I was, but it was very cold. Um, it was as if they were sitting on the one side and I was not allowed to go into their little circle. And I couldn't understand that because for the first time, I was not just someone coming to cast for a commercial. I was actually the casting choreographer. So already in essence, I'm supposed to be taking on this, this, this role of being a choreographer. And when I walked in there, I got that same feeling of being the help. So I went on, I choreographed, I took hold of the casting. And by the end of it, they were also impressed with me. And, and I was like, once again, I had to prove myself to you. You didn't, you didn't just allow me to, to walk into the space the way you walked into the space, because I could have had those same questions about them. What, what, what qualifies you to sit in that? position, that seat. Is it because you're white? I was thinking to myself, had it been a white woman or guy walking in there, would they have got the same treatment? So I think there's a lot of things to be unpacked, but I welcome it because I know that we are stepping into a new dimension where we are going to have our voices heard we are going to be seen because we need to start occupying those spaces. Thank you so much for that contribution. I just feel so yeah. galvanized after yeah. that conversation. I just feel like I am ready to take action. I actually feel quite inspired. Yeah. I feel like, you know, we, we, we've got something to work towards. Um, and my biggest takeaway really is representation across the whole board. Yeah. You know, that actually came up of how important it is not just to see more black faces on, on, on stage, but we want to see them all over. Everywhere. From top to bottom. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, we know that you at home have stories to tell as well. So join the conversation. Yeah. Hop on board. Hop on board. Join us. Use our hashtag, The Black Corner, on any social media platform. Tell us your experience. What's positive and negative representation? As a person of color, we really, really want to hear from you guys. That is all from us today. I am Sibusis Mkosana. And I'm Masako Fanikerk. And we will see you in our next episode of The Black Corner. Next time on The Black Corner, we talk about all the things that make us tick. There are those moments where you just feel like, yikes, I feel so invalidated, I feel so trivialized, I feel so dismissed and unseen. It definitely breeds um, adults to have a sort of self-hate. Just because our bodies are built differently, it does not infringe on our ability to perform the required work. You should be grateful that I am skilled and that, that, that you can use the skills that I bring to this table. Tune in to The Black Corner every Wednesday on our YouTube channel.